the care in the community. So that, that seems to work well. And the third one, which in our country, we can do very little about, is to set up elder care homes. I mean, how many can you set up? How many will they accommodate? But this is critical for those who are destitute. And I think at least for that category, which will be in millions, we need to quickly accelerate what we do in terms of elder care homes, which of course, once again, requires budgetary allocations and money because very, very difficult. Now, maybe you know some companies through CSR funds may do it, some others may contribute donations, but the bulk of it will have to come from the government and we just have to find money for this. So, you know, which means all this really comes back to something we'll talk of a little later is both jobs, but more importantly, the economy. Yeah. So let me just uh, uh, talk about another issue pertaining to the demographics is urban versus rural. Uh, we have seen a lot of people going back to their homes in uh, rural areas and working from home from there or uh, getting engaged in some way or the other. But uh, the, the trend overall has been towards urbanization. And therefore, the quality of life in urban areas uh, have deteriorated in last many years. And it was projected to deteriorate further. Now, if we were to uh, become uh, you know, successful country to some extent by 2030, I suppose that trend needs to be moderated. And the pressure on the urban area need to be reduced because all the urban infrastructure in most of the larger cities is in uh, very poor shape or in shambles or far uh, less stronger than what is required. So how can we reverse this uh, flow of people, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, lacks of people to urban areas and uh, rurals, uh, uh, rural their areas are completely kind of, uh, uh, you know, left behind to their families and children nobody to care for them. So it's a kind of uh, very asymmetrical uh, uh, density of population, which, which gives rise to so many social problems and uh, brings pressure on all the existing infrastructure of health, etc. So how can we reverse this trend so that there is a, some little better balance is achieved, at least by 2030? One of the exciting things about technology, which I mentioned, which has come out in the last one year, is the possibilities it has thrown open for decentralization. This was always there like a Zoom call, you might say, but it has now become huge because as you mentioned, a lot of people are not just working from home, but are working from anywhere. And many of them have chosen that anywhere to be a smaller town, their hometown, their village. And a few have chosen to go off to nice locations and just go there and work because they feel they can work from there. And I have a sense that with this and other new technologies, if we push hard enough, we can create in these next 10 years a completely different model of development where industries are decentralized. Because today, what you have in many, many areas, not all, but I agree to that, but in many areas is not economies of scale, but economies of scope. You know, what can you do, not by setting up one large, huge industrial facility which produces you know millions of whatever but can you decentralize it so that the scope of each is well defined and clear so it's in many ways the model exists already if you look at the global supply chains you know parts are made all over the world and then they come together and fall together in some one place where they're assembled and if you take something like a, like a cell phone typically the parts are made in a most of them are made in a few countries but if you count all of them, there are dozens of countries which contribute to one cell phone of one brand. So, you know, there's no reason why in the same way we can't disperse production. But a must for that is two things. One is high speed and excellent connectivity in terms of bandwidth, electronic connectivity. The other, equally important, is good physical connectivity because these things have to be moved and shipped. Some of them may be services but many of them are physical things. And so unless you have good logistics, you have good roads that go out. So, you know, the dream of things being done in villages may be some time off, but you can certainly move to district centers, even to talukas for much of the production today and yet get it done as maybe more efficiently than other places. Let me tell you one example, you know, in the IT industry, we have found that certain kinds of jobs which don't require the highest levels of skill but medium levels of skills, which might require, say, a graduate, can now be done in small taluka places and districts 
And there are two or three advantages. One is the cost is lower because obviously the real estate is cheaper. Second, your salaries are lower because not your people there are unfortunately maybe but paid less, but also because they're happier being paid less because they're staying at home. The third is importantly that your attrition or your turnover rate is very low because people are happy staying where they are. They don't want to leave the job. And so a lot of companies which are doing work, which is sort of middle level, not the high-end work yet, are moving to that. And more recently with the pandemic, a few people have found that very high-end work, you know, a consultant who is doing something doesn't have to be in the office. So that person goes and he probably sits in, you know, I don't know where, maybe Goa and works from there. And again, you don't need to centralize. So I think these are just a few examples. I'm sure we can take it further. But your core point, this is, this is a direction, a trend, a dream. I think it's feasible. I don't think it's just a dream. But in the next 10 years, our urban infrastructure is going to creak. We have to do something about it and really quickly. And it's not just the urban infrastructure, but the problem of demography give rise to second order problems like crowding, ghettos, poor health, crime, a whole host of other issues which we need to handle. And it may also perhaps uh, take care of uh, the need to look after elders because if people are uh, staying in villages, yes. the homes are larger, the parents are with them. And uh, it could be a win-win for all. I mean, in the sense, as a society as a whole, a large number of uh, parents uh, and elderly are taken care of. Uh, and uh, those areas can develop. So there could be a better balance rather than islands of very high development and no development at all. So good balance society can emerge. You're absolutely right on that. Now, let me uh, move to the second uh, uh, pair that we mentioned, education and jobs. So... Uh, uh, literacy rate, as we mentioned, has gone up from, uh, uh, you know, from uh, around 60 to 78 uh, percent over these years. But still, we find that when people are apply for jobs and they are evaluated, most of them are not employed. Now, what can be done to alter, uh, alter the education system in general? You have written in your chapter on education that good education is extremely difficult and there is a problem about the quality of education at all levels, right from primary school to high school to undergrad to postgraduate courses and so on, and even the doctoral work, doctoral work itself. So there are there are huge issues there in the sense that we might be uh, kind of uh, boasting that we produced uh, X number of engineers and Y number of doctors and so on, but the quality of uh, the output is, uh, is uh, far from what it should be. How do we get about correcting this? You know, Indipal, with, uh, I know a number of people here have long been associated with the academia, and I hesitate amidst all these luminaries to make any comments on the whole education and academic can, system. Can you, you can be gentle, Kiran. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me try. That's, that's not my forte to be gentle, but let me try. <laughs> no, I've, I've made some drastic suggestions because, as you said, yes, the, our, our quality requires you know, leaves much to be desired. But let's recognize that we also have a number of world-class institutions. The problem is that spread is very high from a small number of really excellent institutions that produce truly world-class professionals, be it an IIM or an IIT or a design school or even a law school. Some of the better ones are producing the among the world's best. I don't doubt that at all. But the tail is very long and it's very bad. And those coming out of there are, as you rightly said, unemployable. I know some years back in a meeting of vice chancellors, well, many years back, it was not popular to say, so now it's at least recognized a little. I said that almost 50% of the graduates you produce are unemployable. And I thought I'd be winched because the vice chancellors were very unhappy with that kind of public statement. But that's a fact. You know, two reasons for that. One is the curriculum is vastly outdated. Second, the quality of teaching and teachers is poor. And third, the whole skills that they're imparted, and I, by skills, I just don't mean, you know, engineering type shop floor skills. I mean, skills like critical thinking, skills like teamwork, skills like cultural diversity, just non-existent, completely non-existent. So I think we need a drastic change. And, you know, I may exaggerate to make the point, but if I leave out the top 5%, let's say 10, 15% of our institutions, the rest are in really bad shape. And I've made some rather drastic suggestions here. And let me just mention two of them in the past. I mean, preempting you. One is that we are too centralized. 
Everything is controlled and command from Delhi, uh, not just the UGC or the AICT, but the Ministry of Education issues uh, firmans uh, for greatly detailed things. I've seen some amazing ones, which you know micromanage everything that a single institution does somewhere. So I think these are not tenable. There's no possibility of innovation. Uh, the input is you know, largely controlled by various kinds of parameters. Some of them with good intent, like quotas, some with other things. The fees are controlled. What you pay professors is by and large controlled. So what is the control that an educational institution, somebody wants to really create a good educational institution, what are the degrees of freedom that he or she has? Now, there are a few, you know, I would say clever universities in the recent past, maybe the last five to 10 years, that have tried to overcome this by other means. And those that have, have been very successful. And, you know, it may be more branding than work, but I think places like Ashoka University, the new emerging Kriya University, they have done excellent work. And they're private universities, Shivnadar University. And I think these are universities that have shown the path, what can be done. Uh, these are private universities, so I'm not extolling private universities at all. But, you know, compared to what we had, I think these are examples. Now, if, if we were able to liberate education to some extent, and the government should not, in my mind, get out of it, even for higher education, but it should set the benchmark, as it did so well for engineering and management. Having set that benchmark at engineering and management, we had something like the Indian School of Business, the ISB come up, which was private, but which had to match the IIMs if they wanted to charge high fees and do a good job. And similarly, there have been a few engineering schools which have come up, which have had to match the IITs. But we have not done that elsewhere. And sadly, if I jump ahead very quickly and briefly, in school education, it's been just terrible. We have neglected it for many years and nobody's bothered about it. It's not even paid lip service. I've only seen, in my experience, a couple of governments do something seriously about it. And since I'm in Delhi, let me say that the Delhi government has done an outstanding job of not just trying, but actually achieving a transformation of the government educational system where many, many people, not because of fees, but even before that, have moved their children from private schools, the so-called assumption that private schools are better, have moved them to government schools. So I, I see signs of hope, but not unless this becomes an agenda item uh, for people, first of all, and therefore for political parties. In Delhi, it did become an agenda. The party rode back to power on the basis of what they'd done, mainly in education and health. And I think, hopefully, it will serve as an example to others. So your basic message is to the regulators is that uh, stop meddling and uh, to the uh, people who rule us, the message is that uh, do think about it, look at these models of success which are there elsewhere in the country, try and learn from them. I wish they were abroad because, you know, generally we want to go abroad to learn. You know, we had uh, one uh, local uh, Mumbai team wanted to go and study some system as far as in Australia or somewhere. But uh, Delhi, I don't know how many people will be willing to go and look at their model as to how they've transformed public education. So perhaps we are uh, running out of time. We have, I think, about 10 minutes or so. So let me come back to another very uh, vexing issue of uh, new education policy. Uh, you know, I have uh, read it some time ago, about 56 pages. The committee was headed by a very eminent uh, person, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, and a lot of wonderful suggestions were made. But uh, I, I don't think it, it would work at the ground level. I mean, I don't know how it is going to make positive impact in terms of changing the quality of education. Uh, when, when our, you know, given the size of a country, given the fact that education is both a state subject and the center subject at all, a lot of money comes uh, from the center in this. And this our urge to uh, meddle and uh, take control and uh, bureaucratic interference, etc., also that uh, our uh, <clears throat> urge to standardize uh, learnings and things like that. So how, how, how is this uh, new education policy going to change the course of education in the coming years so that the second uh, building block of, uh, of a you know, kind of emergingly strong nation is uh, at least well laid, the foundation of that block is laid well in the next seven, eight years? Uh, in the past, let me try to be brief. I've taken too much time, so let me answer this one briefly. You know, I think the uh, the new national education policy 
is a very, very good document when it starts out. It lays out the issues and gives some excellent ideas on how they might be looked at. But to me, and I may be very unfair on them, including my good friend uh, Rangan on this, uh, at the end, when they make their recommendations, they, they come back to what is a highly centralized controlled model. And I'm not happy with that because especially for higher education, it must be left to the autonomy, the freedom, the innovation of different institutions. You can't, as you rightly said, standardize because standardization means mediocrity. The only way you can standardize, as we've seen, if I said, as I said earlier, if I take the curve between our uh, higher education institutions, a few excellent and a long tail of really bad institutions, if I were to standardize them, the average would be definitely at the low end. The median would be very, very much at the low end, but so would the average. So I think the standardization and trying to control everything is not a good idea. There will be some institutions that are institutions of excellence, and the government has done it itself. I mentioned the IITs, they've done that. The IITs are recognizably better than the so-called National Institutes of Education, which is also a central government. There is a difference. Maybe the IITs are better funded, but there is a difference in terms of the excellence that happens. So, you know, trying to standardize whether it is curriculum or whether how you get somebody, or as I said, what you pay people, I think that's not a good idea. And that to me is the crux of the overall issue. I am not going to detail, but that's the crux of it. School education is far more complicated. You're right, the states play a very, very, very major role. And, you know, we've, it's more complex. I've not delved into it even in my book in great detail. But as I said, there are some good models. Uh, to me, I've mentioned the Delhi model at some length in that. But the Kerala model, from what I hear, I've not seen it recently, is also very good. And there are other states, undoubtedly. And you, as you mentioned rightly, a lot of learning can be just between our states because the systems in terms of bureaucracy is not too different. So what we can learn within the country may be more valuable than what we learn from outside. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now uh, about the jobs and livelihoods. Uh, it's a very nicely you have uh, uh, clarified the two that, okay, we may not be able to provide 90 million jobs in the decade, but at least we can create a huge uh, amount or number of livelihoods uh, opportunities for people. Uh, what are your major, uh, 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 what you call, so, suggestions on that? What are the kind of solutions that you're proposing on creating livelihoods from millions of people? You know, I, I think there are two or three opportunities which we need to look at. Some are yet small, but will grow. Uh, and one of them, uh, I, I, I'm deeply involved with technology, but I must stress that I'm not pushing technology, nor am I a technology fan. As I said, in the case of health, I think very often sociological and cultural factors are more important. But yet, I see technology as being a great possible driver. And I think of this every time I see you know, a vendor, even a street vendor uh, with a cell phone who uses it to get more business, not just for entertainment or to send free messages up and down on WhatsApp, but to actually get business. And I've given some examples of this. I won't dwell on them, where I think a device like this, which is, enables uh, a person who's uh, you know, a, a single person entrepreneur to get better business and make a better livelihood. And many more can come up. This is one kind of possibility. The second, of course, is we need to emphasize on skilling. Long been talk, talked off. For 15 years, we have done things. But you know, somehow, it's not taking off. Now, we need to study why and how it has not. In a few sectors, it has. In most, it hasn't. So we need to understand what is it that we are missing out when we try to skill people for jobs. Where is the gap? Because even today, as we all know, there is a gap. Okay. Yes, employment is down. But there is a gap between what industry needs and what is being provided by, say, an ITI or any skilling place. The third, which to me is a longer term thing, is very exciting, is the combination of the, uh, the technology and the human being, the so-called man plus machine answer. You know, many people ask in the future, are automation and machines going to take away our jobs? What will all human beings do once everything is automated? And I think that's not the solution. The solution is man plus machine. And there are examples of this, and again, I won't elaborate, which have shown that the man plus machine combination, or let me be correct and say the human plus machine combination, is more effective than the machine itself, just by itself. And I think a number of possibilities here, Not I'm not talking of high end, I'm talking of simple things. And a number of people have done experiments. Let me just very briefly in two sentences mention one of them. 
the Tata Group, for example, has done an experiment in relation to healthcare, which we discussed earlier, which is training people in very simple ways in which they can help incoming patients to get things done from appointments to, you know, the doctor tells them, go take an x-ray. So where is an x-ray place in that district place? This person has come from a village. Where should he or she go? What will be the charge? What time is it open? A whole host of such services at a very small fee. And they've actually shown this model where it works. So you're providing employment to somebody by providing them a phone, which can help them to get this data and helping people who are otherwise completely lost. You go into a district hospital and there are villagers who are so lost, they don't know what to do, where to go, whom to see, which queue to stand in. The doctor just writes x-ray. He says, where, where do I go for an x-ray? He has no idea or she has no idea. So this sort of service is both useful and provides jobs. And I see the future as being a possible combination of such human plus machine or human plus technology combinations. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Kiran. Uh, I have seen myself that there are uh, this national uh, institutes, like say, for example, Ames and uh, Nimhans and various others, where there is a centralized uh, system for taking appointments. But to navigate that system is not easy for an average person because he may, he's not so digital savvy, he may not be even aware of that. So making, uh, giving that access to uh, those people, to those institutions, where they can go and take uh, very uh, advanced treatment at a fraction of a cost or, uh, you know, at a very small cost. Uh, that whole opportunity is de denied to them because there is a, some sort of a digital divide that we have been talking about. So I think one good way could be to, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide these facilitators who enable people to take advantage of the, all the system. I think even average villager may not know what all is available from the government in terms of uh, 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 various uh, you know programs that uh, the help or the cash money or in case of emergency some insurance and what have you so getting all these services delivered efficiently to a large population itself could absorb i think many many more people and uh, generate livelihoods we will not go into the uh, gig worker issue because that's uh, it will take away a lot of time and I think we are about at six five. So let me come to uh, jump to the uh, last uh, kind of a chapter of your book, that India 2030, and uh, where you have projected that we will be five trillion dollar economy by then. And uh, we have been talking about five trillion dollar economy by 24. So there is a huge gap between the reality and what we have been projecting. So in this case, if such a thing, then how would we emerge as a winner at the end of this decade? Yeah. No, I think that's a very good question, Indrapal. You know, in terms of the economy, I think we have to be realistic. We're yet far away from where we might aspire to be. And as you said in one of your earlier comments, even my projections of getting from the 2.9 trillion or so dollars that we are at now to even under 6 million by 2030, are based on an 8% growth year on year. So, you know, if you assume, I'm talking of real terms, not nominal, nominal will be higher. But if you talk of real terms, at 8% year on year from now, we will just about go from under six, under three to about six, about doubling in seven, eight years. So that's not going to get us very far in terms of any comparison. And even if you assume that we continue to grow at 8%, not only up to 2030, but for the next 20 years, and that our neighbor and you might say competitor, China, grows at only 4%, even then their GDP in 2050 will be double ours. So I think uh, in terms of becoming an economic superpower, that's not going to happen anytime soon. In terms of being an economic powerhouse, in terms of being a large economy, in terms of overtaking you know, Germany or Japan, yes, that's entirely possible. These are much smaller countries with much smaller populations. Uh, but on a like-for-like -like basis, or worse, per capita income, let's not even talk of that. We'll be way, 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 way down in, in the in the six. We are just about over $2,000 per capita now. And, you know, Singapore is 60,000, US is 60,000, uh, China is 20,000, so, or 12,000, whatever. So, you know, I think that's... So I, I would direct my efforts more in the economy at seeing that how do we ensure that what we did so successfully in the, in the 10 years or so from 2004 to 2012 
that we took an estimated 276 million people out of what is called multidimensional poverty. And even if you take the absolute poverty line, which is just money, some 170 million people in those eight, nine years were lifted above the poverty line. After that, we have slowed down. Latest figures are not available. But I think if we set our targets, as I said earlier, metrics are important. GDP is fine. Per capita income is fine. But can we focus on metrics like number of people below the poverty line? Can we focus on nutrition and health for children, which are all in a way connected to not just how much they earn, but what kind of services and how efficiently we provide? I would think that should be more the focus rather than looking at GDP or per capita income. I hope uh, the policymakers uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, listen to you very carefully and think about that. But before we come to uh, uh, our uh, uh, the questions on uh, the section about uh, the five determinants that we spoke about, the final one that I want to ask you that there is a huge bit of, there are a large number of very capable people in the country. They have written extensively, those people who have endorsed your book. Uh, they're very, very well-known, Dr. Uh, 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 Vijay Kelkar, Dr. Mashel Kirk, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Raghuram Rajan, uh, Shashi Tharoor, Kiran, uh, Karan Thapar, and so on. So there are very eminent people, very smart people, all this put together. And similarly, there may be so many others in the, in the country or in the government and so on. And yet we are kind of uh, looking at a scenario that we may fall behind from what where we want to be. And that in a very significant way and uh, causing uh, hardship, misery and the loss of dreams to millions of people. Now, what could be, according to you, are three major causes that does not enable to be what we want to be? What is coming in the way? Just the three main causes. Yeah, that's an always a, a tough question in the past to, to pick three. But, you know, from party top of mind or from, I would say, my concerns, I would say three things. One very important is social harmony, because social harmony is not something that's good in itself and good for the economy, but will also help us to reduce hugely or very, very high internal security expenditure, which is not properly accounted for anywhere, but which is taking a huge amount of both strain and problems for the country. The second, I would say, is much more efficient management of our services. Uh, we talked earlier of health and the problems. We talked of education. These are critical building blocks and foundations for how the country has to move forward. If we can't manage these services efficiently, effectively, and well, then you know it's going to be very, very difficult. And the third obvious one is in relation to what we spoke about earlier, which relates in some way to this, is how do you create the jobs and livelihoods? And I think these are three critical areas. But you know, to your first comment about saying we, how do we get to where we want to be and it's disappointing that we may not be there. I would refer you back to, I think, the ending of my book, where I would say my goal is not that we should become a, you know, economic superpower by 2050, even 2030, which we will not be. It's not that we should be a military superpower by 2050, which may be possible, but very difficult but that we should be by 2050, if not even 2030 itself, a happy country. So, Kiran, is there any other alternative you have thought of besides happy that, for example, a proud country or a resilient country or any other attribute uh, instead of happy? Because happiness is such a nebulous thing. And uh, I am reminded of Bertrand Russell's old essay that is happiness still possible? I mean, in this kind of scenario. So, uh, aren't you... Uh, Aren't you, uh, you know, hoping for something uh, which is uh, very aspirational? Well, so right in the power, in a sense, my my answer or my ending comment uh, begs the question. But you know, I, let me let me put some virtue on it, which I genuinely believe. Happiness, as you rightly said, is very nebulous, and therefore, it's each person's definition. What makes you happy may not make the other person happy. Some people are happy with a lot of material stuff, you know, money, goods, nice things. Some people are very happy doing what they want. Some people are happy just doing a painting. So it varies. And therefore, I would say that like everything else in this country, with the kind of diversities, not only of the kind of diversities we have in different ways, but diversities of the human mind. Uh, happy is, to me, a good definition because to each his own or her own. So let each person define 
what that happy means to them. And as long as each one of us is happy in our own way, we will create a happy country. Yeah, so we will have to not to really look at the government or any other uh, mechanisms to make us happy, but we have to be our own masters and be happy. Now, let me let me uh, end the conversation with uh, 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 a few lighter questions. You have written three more books. Which is the book that you enjoyed writing the most? Uh, you know, I'd it's love to say... Rapid, rapid fire as the book. Okay, the rapid fire. I, I'd love to say this one because that's good in terms of getting everybody to read this book. But very frankly, I think it was Crooked Minds. I enjoyed that tremendously. It's about innovation. And I picked a lot of examples of innovation from here and there. And I enjoyed finding those examples, researching them, looking for examples in India, looking elsewhere. So, you know, in terms of just enjoyable, I would say Crooked Minds. Okay. The other thing is, uh, in the recent part, which is the most, uh, uh, the book that has that has influenced you the most? I mean, in the sense you said, aha, something like this I should have also written or I should write going forward. Is there any book you can think of which you have uh, really admired? Written by someone else, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that ending <laughs> statement. <laughs> no, uh, no, very difficult to pick one straight off top of my mind. So on this rapid fire one, I, I, I must take a pass. Yeah, I find it difficult okay. to pick uh, just one which, which struck me as being All right. It, it, the next one, if your publisher agreed uh, and allowed you to add one more chapter, uh, hope, uh, hoping that he had control on the, um, the content of the book, which chapter would you have added? On which subject? You have left out, I mean, you have covered many, many topics, but which 10th determinant you would have added? The 10th commandment sort of thing or the 10th determinant? You know, I, I would probably have picked the uh, environment uh, because I think the whole issue of environment, not just the overarching one of climate change, but environment, which is air, water, land, I think it's become increasingly and immediately important. I'm talking in the context of 2030 for this country, it is going to become important. And I've covered it here and there, but I've not given it the emphasis I should. It deserves. Okay. Now I come to, uh, over the years, you have uh, had, uh, uh, you know, you have been in, uh, uh, connected with, I think, very eminent people at ISRO, at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, your uh, years at NASCOM, thereafter, and so on. So in your uh, long uh, career of four decades, uh, could you please name one person who has influenced your thinking or whom you have admired the most? And can you share one anecdote of that person to tell us as to why why you admire him the most? Why you still remember that person after so many years and uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, 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 give his example to others? Any one person you can think of? Uh, Indrapal, you probably know the answer to this straight away because... I would unhesitatingly pick Dr. Vikram Sarabhai as, as the person who has, you know, both influenced me the greatest and uh, been in many ways uh, uh, continuing to be a mentor and guide. I worked with him very closely for just three years before he passed away very early. But those three years taught me a lot. And those were my first three years, so obviously they're formative years. If you talk of an anecdote, you know, I can think of so many and it's difficult to pick one particular one but I would say is that somehow his, his, um, uh, his care for what the, you might say, common, common man, for lack of any other word, can benefit from was tremendous. And let me put this a different way, because when I first met him, uh, you, you, I don't know whether you recall, when we were at IIM, he came personally for the interviews when we were being placed. And, you know, I went there, frankly, for a lark. And everybody, including, I suppose, some of you and most of our professors thought it's quite mad for an MBA to try and go into government. But I went and what sold me was this whole concept saying, look, I want to use this atomic energy recruitment of MBAs as a, as a you might say, a pincer or a wedge to get into the government system to bring in completely new ways of thinking. We have so far been, and remember, this was late 60s, as you would know. We have so far been stuck on government being law and order revenue collection. I want us to be development focused. The government must focus on development. And I want to bring in managerial talent who takes a view of this, just as companies look for profits, can we look at the bottom line of what development we've been able to create? And I was completely sold on this very concept of saying, look, you guys claim you can bring efficiency, you claim your change agents, 
So come and change the government. Start with atomic energy and let's see what we can do beyond that to take these wider concepts. And just a sentence in background, which some of you may recognize, and Indrapal, you were, I know you've read widely on him. This, this was the years when McNamara in the US as Secretary of Defense had brought in completely new concepts, which you know some of which were new and made their way into management, some of which came from management into defense, which are things like critical path, but you know, zero-based budgeting, all these kinds of concepts. And I was very sold on that. So that's the story. <laughs> Thank you. So, Kiran, uh, in your book, uh, finally, uh, friends who have been listening to us, uh, this is uh, this book is all about the new development model for India. In a way, if you look uh, deeply into it, uh, Kiran has uh, touched, as I said, those nine critical determinants. He has suggested numerous ideas how to take our country forward, what should be the corrections that we should make. And you would have got a good bit of uh, an idea as to what has gone into writing of this book and why this book has been written at this time. So I think those questions, though we did ask him specifically, but now you can very well appreciate that if at all there was a time to transform, it is now. And this book would uh, prove to be a catalyst uh, in that uh, to provoke uh, that kind of a debate and discussion at uh, numerous uh, fora uh, all over the country. I would, those who are in the in academics or other organizations, I would request them to have this book and form some study circles and maybe read each chapter at a time, discuss threadbare, do research onto thing and create a debate and widespread awareness that are we doing the right thing to take uh, 140 million uh, billion people, uh, uh, you know, to uh, uh, on the right path? Will they have a good future? Will they be happy? Will they be healthy? Will they be educated? And uh, what sort of kind of societies our children are? children and grandchildren are going to live into, etc. So I think uh, this can become a very good starting point for creating that kind of a discussion and uh, bringing about change into our governance systems, our uh, the way we manage our business and so on. So this is a fabulous catalyst. This book is a fabulous catalyst for all that. So Kiran, thank you so much for your valuable time. I know you are connected with so many organizations and you've taken so much time off now. So I will hand it over to Dr. Yadav for q and I've taken a few minutes more, but I thought uh, uh, you should know Mr. Karnik as to where he's coming from. What is he trying to do all these many years? And I hope you've got a glimpse of his uh, uh, very, uh, very powerful uh, mind and his personality wanting to change the country for the betterment. Thank you all. To Over to Dr. Kiran Yadav, you may directly take the question to Mr. Karnik, and then we will end. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Indrapal ji. Uh, surely, I think this has been one of the most enriching sessions that I've attended uh, so far with BMA. Because uh, one of the things Mr. Karnik came out is that he didn't give you know, spot answers to uh, problems, but he actually made us aware more of uh, what the reality is and how it needs to be looked at. And I, I, I love your formula, sir, where you said, our goal should be a happy country. And my takeaway from that is that uh, we, which means that we should enjoy our freedom, respect our freedom, value our freedom, and take advantage of our freedom. Because everything else is then controlled. And, uh, you know, uh, either it will be controlled at the state level or the central level or somebody else. And that actually kills the innovation and nation building spirit. So thank you so much for that. So there's a question. Uh, uh, is Rashmi Sharma in there? Can I request you to unmute and uh, ask your question? Uh, yes, actually, when I was, uh, hello, everyone. Good evening, sir. It was really a wonderful session. And because I'm from the educational background, and uh, I was just thought uh, about the employability. And after that, I came into entrepreneurship. And I found that there are a lot of restrictions in India to start a business or something so do you think that the employability problem which is un, you know you have predicted the data it's a huge unemployed people will be there it's a large number of population so is it what you suggested that entrepreneurship should be encouraged into the youth so rather than looking seeking some employment somewhere else they can be the employer to other people as well yeah. no, I, I, absolutely Rashmi. i think there's no question that 
rather than become being job seekers, we should create more job creators. Uh, and you know, fortunately, the government for many years now has been trying to encourage this. As you know, there are a number of schemes uh, the government itself has. Plus, there is now a very active community of investors, both so-called angel investors and other investors who are willing to invest in new companies. That is, I think, a very important direction for our country, uh, not just in terms of jobs and livelihoods, but also in terms of unleashing, which Mr. Yadav just said, the freedom to unleash the potential of innovation and creativity, which does reside in this country. We see it everywhere in an everyday sense. And if you can somehow help people a little bit without putting too many barriers, some of which you mentioned by, by government or controls, then it might take off. Thank you so much. And other thing is, I, I think that this uh, startups and all of this angel investors, they are mostly popular into big cities, big colleges, which you said. And uh, if we go to the second tier, third tier things, you see the people just running out for the job. And I could see in the colleges with interacting with students there that, yes, there is a huge lack of employability skills into them. So that is another problem, which actually I find that I can't see any solution. It will be good if you can encourage, give some encouragement and uh, your viewpoint to that. No, quite true. I have, I have no easy answer, but you're right that it is the bigger, well-known colleges and big cities that get most of the attention. We need to look more at, you know, tier three, tier two towns and look at other colleges and institutions where many budding entrepreneurs would be there. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I, I think we, we are running short on time, so we could take last two or three questions, sir, if that's okay with you, Mr. Yeah. Kandi. Yeah. Mr. Shane, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask whether there is a human face in the politics today, because there is lots of uh, aggressiveness in achieving so many things in a very competitive environment the GDP and the, the Commonwealth seems to be going up, but those who are left behind very, very far, very, very, not only poor money-wise, but opportunity-wise, do you think there is a human face in the politics to bring them up? Yes, I, I did see your question, Mr. Shanava, on the chat box also. Uh, yeah. Very difficult question to answer. You know, most of us look at politicians, any politician <clears throat> from any party with a degree of suspicion, uh, they're out to line their own pocket or they're for power. But, you know, I think there are maybe a few good people yet who want to do something good. But uh, the system is, you know, such that it's very difficult. So I have no real answers into this. It's a theme for a long discussion. But I wish we did have people who are more concerned about the well-being of, of people at large rather than looking only at a few. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bigyan Verma, one of our committee members of the executive committee of BMA, has put up his hand. Mr. Bigyan Verma, could you please uh, unmute? And... Yeah, hi. Thank you. Good evening. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Kiran, sir, for such a wonderful uh, talk. I have not read your book, but I'm certainly going to buy one and then read. You know, but then I have uh, one question. In fact, a couple of decades, two, three decades back, I read an article in The Economist. Uh, which was titled India, the Uncaged Tiger, you know? Uh, 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 and I still feel like uh, nothing much has changed since then. Uh, India still has a long way to go. And uh, especially in the light of one particular study, which I read some time back, you know, which says like, uh, typically, you know, some countries with, uh, which are rich in uh, natural resources, and this is an economic uh, study by, done by one of, one of the economists, it says that uh, countries which are rich by na in natural resources, they grow at a lower pace and uh, countries which suffer from, uh, from tropical issues like India and all, they still have a much lower rate because of, uh, of growth rate because of the disease and vectors and pests and so on and so forth. Do you think uh, we can ever come out of this kind of phenomena in the days to come? Uh, yes, Mr. Verma, I, I think you asked a, a good question about how we get out of where we are and how do we get out of this? Uh, I don't know if there are any, again, easy solutions or quick ones on this and how we move from where we are to where we ideally should be. Uh, it's something to think about, uh, whether it's, you know, as a previous question, whether it's politics, 
or whether it's other areas of what work we do and how we do it. So I, I don't know that I can give a specific answer to you, but I would say it's something to think about and for all of us to ponder. And one of my hopes in writing this book also was that uh, there would be you know, this kind of discussion, debate and thinking on mm -hmm. the themes, not on the book, on what it covers, so right. that we can chart a direction of what we should all be pushing for in some way. All right. Thank you so much, sir. But I will certainly buy your book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So buy the publisher will be happy. <laughs> buy buy uh, only. Uh, yes, of course. Even I, I'll, be, I'll be happy, Mr. Verma, if you read it. My publisher will be very happy if you buy it. <laughs> yeah. no, no, I'll buy and read, of <laughs> course. <laughs> we need to change the matrix that how many people buy and how many read. Uh, no, no, the no. academics have a long uh, shelves of books, you know, but how many are read? Okay, <laughs> but this is worth reading. I mean, on the, once again, I'm reaffirming. <laughs> sure. Right. So, uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, we... If, if there are any more questions, anyone would like to ask? Kiran, sir, hi. I had a question. Hello. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, the previous question that was there, uh, in which uh, so address related to politicians, uh, I would like to ask Karnik, sir, that, uh, you know, today cabinet expansion is happening. So will it not benefit and will not be a good way forward to the nation building? <laughs> mm -hmm. I would only say yeah. keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best. <laughs> right. uh, yes, can but I, uh, you know, new new blood is inducted and, you know, uh, new people are coming in. Yes. So what would be your view on that? So will not be the performance be improved? No, the, more, more seriously, I think two or three good things. One is the number of women have increased. The second, there's a younger lot. And third, as you rightly said, there are new faces. And every time you get a new person, at least my hope, is that they come in with you know the intent, the good intent, and also the drive to do something to prove themselves. So when you get a new person, typically they tend to achieve more than what people who have been there very long have. But you know, in terms of kind of people, do recognize that, as in any democracy, the political system has its own way of you know sharing rewards. So I, I don't know even even this prime minister was so powerful how much freedom he has to pick whom he wants and put them where he wants. He is somewhat constrained by the fact that there are number of partners, number of contenders, number of states, number of castes, all kinds of things. But I share your, your hope that with the younger lot, uh, with new faces, hopefully there will be some improvement in the way uh, things are delivered, which, which we might get a push. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just before we move on, there are a couple of announcements that I would uh, like to make. One is that if everybody can please switch on their videos so that uh, the uh, secretary can take a photograph of our session. And second is that on uh, coming Friday, the 9th of July, uh, where we have our Friday Funda sessions, this Friday we are going to have Mr. Harish Shetty, who is going to talk about prevention of disease with a healthy diet. I think that's going uh, along with the lines of uh, what uh, Mr. Karnik has been emphasizing on, that we have to find uh, home grown solutions, uh, you know, rather than trying to beat the system uh, uh, back into place, because that's going to be a tall order. So uh, having said that, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Karnik for uh, having uh, taken us through uh, an awareness drive, I would say, to come to reality in terms of where we stand and how far we are from where we want to be and what I uh, what are the areas that we would really need to emphasize and work on if we want to get there. And uh, the ultimate uh, solution, uh, what Mr. Karnik has presented, is that uh, India is a spiritual country. So uh, value your uh, spirituality and learn to be happy. Uh, if not being uh, economically and uh, physically strong, uh, get inner strength to be happy. And that could be our goal for 2050. 
uh, Indrapal ji, I think you actually uh, made uh, brought the best out of Mr. Karnik in terms of his uh, book and making his. So even though I haven't read the book, I have a fair sense of uh, you know what is there, and I'm surely uh, as like Mr. Bigan Verma said, uh, going to pick up a copy and read it. Uh, whether I buy it or not is another issue. <laughs> but. Uh, I think this is one of the uh, rare sessions where uh, we we really had, sir, sincerely a lot of learning, and uh, I think we need to go back and think a lot about uh, how we see things and what should be our action plans for the future. Because ultimately, it's collectively all of us together that uh, make the nation. And uh, having been privileged members of BMA, getting so much of exposure, I think. Be it's our duty to start really thinking what ails us and what needs to be done. So uh, once again, thank you very uh, much. And, Mr. Yadav, uh, before before you before you close, may I just I say a word? Sure, sure, sir. Please. First, I just want to thank you uh, for your introduction and for moderating the questions and being here. Want to also thank Dr. Zagate for you know getting this together and organizing this. And I want to thank all the participants for the very active interest. I saw so many comments on the chat box. And I know that if we had gone on, there would be more questions. Do want to thank participants for sparing the time and coming in. And, you know, I want to thank, of course, Indrapal, most of all. Though I must say I'm a little unhappy. You know, he's done so much work on the book and brought out so much that, you know, most of you, I have been listening to this. I said, now I don't need to buy the book. I know all about it already. <laughs> Indrapal, thank you very much. I know you've done a lot of work on it. And thank you for asking the very yeah. searching and good questions. Okay. Uh, if our photographs are done, then uh, wishing you all a very good evening and see you all, all on Friday, sir. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great session we had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.